So what I'd like to do is welcome up Don, and um, I think it'll be a very enjoyable session. <laughs> thanks, Dave. Welcome. Well, thanks very much. Thanks uh, for coming back. Gee, there's so many interesting things to be doing on this particular day. I'm amazed you showed up at all. So <laughs> I love working with diehards. Um, yeah, and I'd like to thank HP for inviting me. I have a great relationship with the company. Uh, Moxie Insight uh, does large, large for us, multi-million dollar syndicated uh, research projects on how information technology transforms uh, the enterprise. Some of you are, are members of our, our work, and if any of you would like to know more about that, I'm uh, available for the rest of the day. Um, although when Paul McCartney's playing, maybe I'm amazed, I'll probably be on stage playing keyboards, although his people haven't called me yet about, about that. So if any of you are with, any of you with Paul? Oh, no. Well, if any of you know someone who's with Paul, have his people call my people, because I'm actually in a band. This is a little known fact. It's called Men in Suits. And um, we, we used to do a, uh, a gig every year, whether our public demanded it or not. But uh, we, actually, we actually got good. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, what I've been asked to do is to kind of pull things together for you from the last couple of days, and to go up to about 60,000 feet, and to talk about how all these changes in technology are part of a very uh, fundamental change. And I like the theme of this whole event a lot, Discover, because I think we are discovering um, nothing less than a new age. I think it's finally happening. The industrial age is finally running out of gas. And as the CIO, you're in a unique position to provide leadership and to address a crisis of leadership that's emerging uh, from my experience in the enterprise. So let's get into that. I I'm going to start uh, by telling you a story. And I'd like to say, yes, we scour the world for amazing lighthouse case studies and find the most interesting examples. Uh, but in this case, I can't say that because the reason I know the story is this guy, Rob McEwen, moved across the street from me. And he held a, a cocktail party to meet the neighbors. And uh, he said, you're Don Tapscott. I read some of your books. Great. And I said, yeah, what do you do? And he says, well, I used to be a banker, and now I'm a gold miner. He's a funny guy. He introduces his wife, Cheryl. He says, this is Cheryl. She's a gold digger. But uh, <laughs> thankfully, she's a very accomplished person with a sense of humor. But anyway, he tells me this amazing story. This is about five years ago. And he took over as the principal shareholder of a gold mine, Red Lake, northern Canada. And his geologists couldn't tell him where to go into production. So he'd give them more money for geological data, another $5 million, another $10 million. They'd come back. They'd have more data. They couldn't tell him where the gold was. After a couple of years, three years, he was so frustrated, he was ready to shut the whole thing down. But he had an epiphany one day. He wondered. If my geologists don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he did a radical thing. He took his intellectual property, his geological data, which in the mining industry is your biggest secret. It's kept in safes and high security computer systems. And he published it and held a contest on the internet called the Gold Corp Challenge. It was basically uh, half a million dollars for anyone who can tell me, do I have any gold? And if so, where is it? And he got submissions from all around the world, 77 submissions. They used techniques that he'd never heard of. And for his 500, uh, did I say 500 million? $500,000 in prize money, he found $3.4 billion worth of gold. And the market value of his company went from 90 million to 10 billion. I had dinner with him recently. Gold Corp is now worth $33 billion. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, He's a happy camper. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, it's not just that he used some little trick. He thought about the modus operandi of a corporation very differently. And he embraced a set of principles that are very different than the way we run companies today. We have traditional, vertically integrated command and control hierarchies. And talent is inside our boundaries, right? The most precious asset goes out the elevator every night. So what he should have done is fired his head of geology. He didn't. He peered. 
he wondered, who are their peers? You know, some of the best submissions didn't come from geologists. They came from computer science uh, scientists, mathematicians. He had chemists giving organic solutions to these inorganic problems. And the winner was a computer graphics company that built a three-dimensional model of the mind. He peered. He viewed talent as being inside and outside. He was open. He stood up in front of the world and he said, I'm the CEO of this gold mining company and I don't know if we have any gold, but we're going to find out and you can trust me. He shared his intellectual property. Now, you don't want to share all of your IP, but he shared some of it. He didn't think global and act local. He acted globally. He viewed the world as his geology department, and he increased the value of his company by two orders of magnitude. Now, this is what we talked about in, in uh, Wikonomics. And um, thank you for that too kind introduction, Dave, but not all of my books have been bestsellers. I'm sorry to say. Uh, half of them were dogs. <laughs> I actually wrote a book in 1981 about the internet, and it was a study in bad timing. I think my mother bought most of those. So, and some of you will remember, you've been around. The big reason why managers and professionals will never use a computer as a communications tool, managers will never learn to type. That's what I was told. People said, Don, you're just wrong. I became a typing evangelist for five years. And then, of course, we're all talking about the cloud now. Anybody remember time sharing? <laughs> anyway, what we're beginning to see is a profound change in the deep structure and architecture of the corporation and how we orchestrate capability to innovate, to create goods and services, and to engage with the rest of the world. So the book was, it did great, and I was very happy, and then something happened. And I remember the moment. I was speaking that it struck me, this melt, meltdown. I was speaking to a group called Cybos in, in, um, in Brussels in September of 2008. And uh, this is a, uh, bankers. This is about seven, 8,000 bankers. And um, that week, uh, Lehman, uh, Merrill, uh, uh, a couple of the insurance companies. There was the week of the big meltdown. And I looked at this sort of vast sea of deer in the headlights, and it occurred to me, Bob Dylan, there's something going on here, and you don't know what it is. I mean, who would have imagined three years ago that one of the big themes of business books today would be how to save capitalism, or is capitalism even savable? In a survey that came out yesterday, 52% of Americans think it is very or uh, highly probable that we're going to go into a, some kind of depression, was the term used, in the next year. Now, whether or not they're right, there's a lot of unease about this global situation. And uh, we talk about, oh, no, we're in a recovery. It's a jobless recovery. We'll tell that to the 43% of young people in Spain who can't get a job. Jobless recovery, to me, is an oxymoron. There's no recovery unless it's inclusive. 23% youth unemployment in the United States. Now, you know this guy, Paul Krugman, controversial um, guy, writes for the New York Times, Nobel Prize winning economist. For some reason, I end up speaking at the same event as him a lot. And uh, the first time, uh, he spoke before me, and, and he got up and he said, when you have a meltdown of the financial industry, you get a prolonged period of slump. Japan had one in 1992. They're still in a slump. He says, so get ready for a couple of decades of ugliness. And that's the good news scenario. Because some bad news, things can happen. Like one of these countries in Europe defaults on its sovereign debt. The euro goes down. Germany doesn't step up. The global economy goes into a depression. Now, Far be it from me to uh, debate a Nobel Prize winning economist, but I have a different point of view. And it's a very optimistic one, actually. I think that the future is not just something to be predicted, it's something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future. But if we're going to do that, we need to know what the problem is. And the problem doesn't fall within the, the uh, paradigm of traditional economists who worry about things like the business cycle and more fiscal stimulation or not. The problem is not a cyclical one, it's, it's a secular one. We're at, are arguably at a turning point in human history, and that's the 
the topic of the book, which has been uh, given to all of you. It's in your, your room now, and thanks uh, to HP for that. If you look around today, you'll see a whole set of institutions that are in various stages of being frozen or, or stalled or in atrophy or even in, in outright failure. And these institutions arguably have taken us to a certain point around an old model, but now because of a new communications medium that you're all the truck and trade of this conference, we can rebuild these institutions around a very different model and a different set of principles. So I've got very limited time today, and I can't really go into this, but I'll just give you a little flavor. You know, the Industrial Age Corporation was typified by the big three auto companies, America's greatest companies. Well, they did go bankrupt, and they're now working hard to reinvent themselves around a whole new model. And we've got radical new models like local motors, J. Rogers, an Iraq vet, saw his friends get killed in a Humvee beside him. He decided that we're in Iraq to defend America's energy sources, and a lot of that energy goes into what he described as a sclerotic auto industry that's been unable to build um, fuel-efficient, safe um, uh, uh, cars that's externalized its costs onto society. So he's building a whole new kind of auto industry where he's got 5,000 designers, but they're on the web. It's called Local Motors. He doesn't have a 3 million square foot manufacturing facility. He has 30 smaller facilities and 30 local geographies hiring local people to build customized cars for local markets. And he's doing well. Now, could this scale, radical new model, a networked model of design, the design and production of an automobile? Well, the bad news for Jay Rogers, good news too, I guess, is that he now has competitors. The financial system, we haven't really made fundamental changes. Wall Street, um, you know, almost brought down global capitalism. And, you know, I have lots of friends who are senior executives in Wall Street, and we, we debate about this all the time, but they just want to get back to business as usual. I don't think that's going to be workable. I mean, if there's one thing that we should learn from this crisis, it's that business can't succeed in a world that's failing. Newspapers, 70 have gone bankrupt in the United States. The problem that newspapers solve is no longer a problem. So one youngster said, said to us, if the news is important, it will find me. And so for each of these institutions that are stalled, there are these wonderful new models that are emerging. You can make money as a content provider and as a publisher. Thomson Reuters is a great example, as we say in the book. People will pay for value. There are two newspapers that have paywalls. They're probably the only two that can do it. The, the Wall Street Journal and now the New York Times. The New York Times announced yesterday it's working. People will pay for value. The Economist doesn't even have a good website, but if you want live in the United States and you want international news, you pretty much have to read The Economist. And there are these much more radical network models of the news that are uh, uh, emerging. Universities, schools, I mean, the, the university is losing its monopoly on higher education. The smartest kids in the United States don't go to lectures. The biggest thing is to get an A without having ever gone to the lecture. Why would I go to a lecture, says this youngster at Harvard, 300 kids in the room, a teaching assistant's talking to us about Peter Drucker. I can go and interact with Peter, a real time, sort of virtual Peter Drucker online. It's just a better way of learning. So the lecture, the broadcast model of learning, I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, you're a student, you're an empty vessel, you don't, get ready, here it comes. This is the modus operandi of the industrial age, mass production, mass distribution, mass media, mass marketing, mass democracy. I'm a politician, listen to this 30 second negative ad, um, and then you go vote for me and I'm gonna broadcast to you for four years. Young people we know care a lot but they're stepping away from our models of democracy in, in OECD uh, countries because they've grown up interacting and they want to be engaged. So we could go on and on. The healthcare, you know, I'm a, 
system. All the debates that exist today in the United States within healthcare happen within a model that's arguably an industrial age model. I'm a clinician, I have knowledge, you're a patient, you don't. I deliver healthcare to you. You're inert, you're passive, and you don't collaborate with other people. And you know, it's 20% of the GDP. What are we going to do? Fix this by spending more money? We need to move to an a collaborative model of healthcare. You know, every kid born in the United States should get a website. Every baby should have a website. It's half electronic health record and half social network for health. You have all this information. You have, you know, a, a rare disease like um, uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. You go on to the equivalent of patients like me. You collaborate. This has now created a whole foundation for research and, and knowledge. And almost every person with ALS in the United States is benefiting from being part of this community, a collaborative model of healthcare. So if you want to understand what's happening today, I, and this is the 60,000 feet part. I, I don't think you go back, again with deference to Paul Krugman, you don't go back to 91 or 82 or even the Great Depression. You need to go back to a previous time in human history. Well, wasn't that interesting? Um, wow. Um, sorry, it just decided to randomly present itself on the screen. Um, all around the world, we had an agrarian economy. And, uh, was, and, and, the, and the political system was called feudalism. And during that economy, um, knowledge was tightly concentrated in tiny oligopolies, the church and the state, right, and the, the nobles. People didn't have knowledge. There was no concept of progress. You were just born, and you lived, and, and then you kind of died. Um, but when Johannes Gutenberg came up with his great invention, over time people began to acquire knowledge. And the institutions of agrarian feudal society started to appear to be stalled, or frozen, or an atrophy, or even failing. It didn't make sense for the church to be responsible for medicine when people had knowledge. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and nobles to be running everything. So you had the rise of parliamentary democracy, the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace. You saw the creation of, of the, the university, of science, of the corporation, and eventually the Industrial Revolution, and, and this was all good. It advanced our standard of living, but it did come with a cost. And now, once again, the technology genie is out of the bottle. But this time, it's very different. I don't think it's, I don't call this an information age. Rob McEwen had lots of information. What he needed was networked intelligence to make sense of it. Of course, big data is a huge topic, and data is the fuel for a new age. But this is really an age of, uh, of networked intelligence. The, the printing press and subsequent industrial technologies, radio, television, and then the initial wave of computing that, that me and some of you older folks in this room uh, were through, was, was all the one-to-many centralized pushing out content model. The printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of us to be a producer and a publisher. The printing press gave us access to recorded knowledge. The internet gives us access to the intelligence contained in the brains of other humans on a global basis. Now, that sounds like a bit, pretty big abstract idea, but I think that it's got a lot of implications for all of us uh, today. And let me explain. I'll begin by saying this is not a new idea. So, I've been writing about this stuff for 30 years. Did any of you read a book called The Third Wave by Alvin Toffler? Um, yeah, he talked about an agrarian age, an industrial age, and I think he called it an information age, and we can cut him some slack for that. These ideas were, their time had not come. They were ideas in waiting, and they were waiting for some big developments. So let, let me just end with a, a few thoughts on that. They were waiting for the new web, a global ubiquitous computational platform. One of the, at the big, uh, the big tent there at the beginning of the week, one of the big things that flashed across the screen as people were coming in is um, that uh, 
uh, that there will be two trillion devices connected to the internet. The old web, you accessed it through a, a PC tethered to a desktop. Now we have these inert objects that become smart communicating devices. My door here in the, the hotel where I'm staying, it's a new hotel, it has a chip in it, it's internetworked, it probably has a, an IP address. Mike is here from Hyatt, there he is. When, when will, the door has knowledge, when will that door be an internet appliance and uh, wh when I can access it through my mobile device? Very soon, Don. In fact, we have two hotels already that have locks, just as you just described. Yeah. So I have a friend in Toronto, everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address and all the stuff talks to itself. I have no idea what his refrigerator says to his toaster. But uh, he was actually bragging that his fence talks to his sprinkler. And I said, well, Ken, why would you care? He says, well, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. <laughs> so, I mean, this is pervasive ambient computing. It's mobile. It's broadband. It's geospatial. Um, do you know who here has used Google goggles or Layer? You go outside with your little mobile device and you look around, it says, uh, uh, you know, this is the MGM Grand and tonight Paul McCartney's, what do you want, the tourism layer, the shopping layer, or the where are the ATMs layer, there's like thousands of layers. The old web, you surf the web, the new web, you're surfing the real world. We have the rise of web services. You know, Thomas Watson was uh, <laughs> famously to have said that the world will only need five or six computers. And everyone's laughed at Watson. You know what? Unbeknownst to him, he was probably right. He's pretty close, off by one or two. What have we got? We've got the Google computer and the Amazon computer and the HP uh, computer and the Apple that they announced their, their computers. These are all clouds, right? And um, the, the internet's becoming a computational platform. You go onto Flickr, as I did, and I put a picture of my puppy up there. It asks for a, for a name. So I type in Bernese Mountain Dog. In technical terms, I created an XML tag. And I just program the internet. That, uh, that, that tag links up with 934 other Bernese Mountain Dog owners, and I'm finding out why my puppy eats sticks and has digestive problems. So, and the big thing for a CIO is that the internet is now integrating with real IT. In the past, you didn't have to worry about it. The only way these things came together was around this thing called the intranet. Well, now we all have this big computer, or four or five computers, that we can move IT onto, and that's, that's a big challenge. Now, those of you who are at the main session, I made a joke about that. I said that, that and, and I know some of you in this room, you have systems that are old enough to vote and drink. And uh, there is this little detail called the legacy, I know, and, and Leo talks about hybrid computing. And it's a challenge. God may have created the world in six days, but, you know, he didn't have an installed base. So, so number two is that this technology revolution is intersecting with a demographic revolution. The children of the baby boom are the first generation to come of age in the digital age. They're different. Who has uh, kids or grandchildren under the age of 33? Okay, well, that's a very prolific group. Um, I can be brief on this point, right? I started studying kids about 15 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all this sophisticated technology. At first I thought my children are prodigies. And then I noticed that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So um, I started working with 300 kids. In 97 I wrote this book and, and I wrote the sequel th three years ago. This is the first generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. And it's the first time in history when children are an authority about something really important. I was an authority about model trains when I was 11, and today the 11-year-old is an authority on this digital revolution that's changing every institution in society. So um, I'm actually running out of time. I'd, uh, I'll be happy to talk to you uh, 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 informally about this, but ju just an example. Uh, the, this, this is a big group. It was the World Congress on IT, and I uh, interviewed these youngsters, and out of the mouths of babes. On the left, there's, uh, her name is Rahaf Harfou. She was 21, and uh, she was uh, studying in Paris. Her boyfriend's in Toronto, so they turn on video Skype all day long to keep their relationship going. 
Um, I asked her, do you use email? And she said, oh, no, Mr. Tapps got email as yesterday's technology. And I said, well, if you did use email, what would you use it for? She says, email, that's sort of like a formal technology, say, for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That would be a good use of email. <laughs> on, on the uh, right there is uh, Michael Furtick. He's a granddaddy of Mall. He's, he was like 28. I've known Michael since he was 13, when he was the project manager on my website, uh, growingupdigital.com. <laughs> they made him the project manager as a 13-year-old because he was the oldest and most experienced. Uh, when he was 15, he sold his site for an undisclosed seven or eight figure uh, sum. One of the news reports said it was probably only a million dollars. So I sent him a note saying, Michael, you sold it for a million dollars. You should have called me. And he wrote back and he says, Don, legally, I can't tell you uh, how much I sold it for, but I can tell you I'm very happy. And um, he didn't use the money to buy a Ferrari or something. Although he bought a cheap little car, but his mom had to drive around with him because he only had his learner's permit. Um, he he um, used the money to invest in his next new venture. It's called takingitglobal.org. There's four million young people on a social network, kids who want to change the world. So these kids, HP uses the term instant on. It's a good one. They want an instant on uh, enterprise and world. And uh, these are the eight norms of, the, of the, the generation. I'd be happy to talk with you about them offline. Third theme is you put those two together, technology plus demographics, you get a social revolution. Now, I could show you 50 charts, and I won't, but they're all the same. They all show the old HTML website being eclipsed by the XML-based community. The old one th thought the internet was about websites. The new one understands it's about <laughs> vibrant communities. The old one was, says we're a content Creator, the new one says, we're, we create a context where people can self-organize to create their own content. The old one built a website. The new one built a vibrant community. The old one said, content is king. The new one said, we're a curator, not a creator. So um, this is a humbling kind of uh, thing. Just a quick story on this. This is four years ago. My son, Alex who was 20 at the time, a uh, junior in college, I gave him an advanced copy of Wikonomics for a Christmas present. And I gave him some other things <laughs> for Christmas, <laughs> too, OK? <laughs> but uh, he says, thanks, Dad. He went off, started reading the book. He came back a couple hours later. He said, hey, Dad, this is a good book. It's like he's surprised or something <laughs> like that. I said, um, um, I said, great. And he, he says, I think I'll create a community on Facebook. And I had just come on to, to Facebook then, because they changed the EDU thing. And um, I said, can I watch? 15 minutes later, he's got this Wikonomics community. Another 15 minutes later, he's got six members. By the time we're eating turkey on Christmas night, he's got 130 members in seven countries, seven regional coordinators, a president himself, a secretary, and a chief information officer for the communities. He's, he's sent out a PDF for the first two chapters of the book. By the time I'm at Christmas dinner, I got kids writing in saying, uh, Mr. Tapscott, we found errors in your book. And the community is placing demands on me. <laughs> One of the kids is saying, exactly how will Mr. Tapscott be contributing to our community? It's like, what is this? Well, this is self-organization, creating a context. And you understand that, good things that can happen. Barack Obama understood it. He changed the way you got elected. I'm not sure he applied that to the way you rule and govern, and it's costing him. Again, the, the way I discovered this three years ago, someone sent me an email saying, do you know this guy, Obama? He's, he thinks your book is the key to winning the presidency and transforming America. Go to mybrackobama.com. So I go there, there's my book. It says, we believe in the principles of transparency and partnering the, in the book, Wikonomics, use of the internet. And he says, I'm asking you to believe not just in my ability to bring about real change in Washington, I'm asking you to believe in yours. And, and I looked at this thing and, well, my first reaction was, I am the man. Um, but I looked a little more carefully. It turns out I'm not the man. <laughs> because there was a Wikonomics community, but there's also a single moms for daycare for Obama community. And there's a uh, young firefighters for Obama community. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized, and that's what brought him to power. This is a revolutionary force. 
Now, everyone uses the term revolution, but you know what? There's actually a revolution in revolutions today. The wiki revolutions of the Arab Spring. You know the big debate, Malcolm Gladwell, the revolution will not be tweeted. I was deeply involved in that debate saying, no, Malcolm, you're a good guy, but you're wrong on this. And then reality intervened. And young people were tired of being subjects. They were coming into the workforce. They wanted to have jobs. And they wanted to, have, to participate in democratic life. And they risked their lives. They couldn't go home and give up because if they did, the regime would hunt them down. And that's still why they're in the streets today. So you understand this power of a new communications medium, not just to drop transaction costs within the corporation, but they drop the transaction costs of dissent. Now the final thing is that this is leading to a big change in the enterprise. And of course, that's what we're talking about today. And we've created vertically integrated hierarchies throughout the industrial age because the cost of transactions and collaboration in an open market were greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundaries of the corporation. And some of you may remember I wrote a book called Paradigm Shift a couple of decades ago and I said, I think IT is making the boundaries of the corporation more porous. Back then we called it the extended enterprise. Then we saw companies like HP and Cisco and so on unbundle into focus companies that worked within business networks. And they were successful when their competitors tended to fall behind. And now collaboration costs are dropping so much that peers can come together and create value. You can be like Rob McEwen and find peers for your geologists. Peers in the sense of companies acting as peers. The Chinese motorcycle industry is dozens of little companies. They all cooperate together. They meet on the internet. And in tea houses, there's no OEM. There's no Harley Davidson pulling all the strings. Peers can create something like an encyclopedia or a computer operating system. Social networking is becoming a new mode of production. Social production. And this is a time of very profound change. Combine in the, uh, the economic crisis, and now that's why we're all sitting here wondering not just how do we tweak this or use the cloud or this or that, how do we provide leadership for bringing about deep changes in our enterprise? So you'll read, um, these are my five principles of how we need to rebuild all of our institutions, corporations, government, you name it, uh, around a new set of principles. So I'm going to wrap up then um, by just posing to you uh, this challenge of leadership. Because I don't think there's ever been a more exciting time to be in business. The, opportunity, the, the opportunities are just huge. But there's never been a more exciting time to be an IT executive because you're sort of like that Janus, one side to the business and one to technology. And you're at the center of, I think, the biggest change to the enterprise, probably, in a century. So when all is said and done, sure, there's lots of danger and peril and everything. But, but if we take a different route, and rebuild these institutions around a new medium of communications and a new set of principles, the future uh, can be a bright one. Let me end with a, a, a short little video where I, I want to just talk to you about a big idea. Towards the end of the book, Anthony and I started wondering, what does an age of networked intelligence look like? And how would it be fundamentally different from the industrial age? And we'd studied hundreds and hundreds of case, human cases, and we decided that we'd go to nature to, find, uh, to try and learn something from that. And we discovered something called a murmuration. Uh, fish come in schools, uh, sheep come in flocks, starlings over the moors of England come in something called a murmuration. And throughout the day, uh, the starlings are out over a 20 mile radius and they're sort of doing their starling thing. Uh, they're foraging for food and so on. And at night, they come together and they create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature. 
It's called a murmuration in reference to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And the murmuration is not just for show, it has many functions. It warms the birds up for the cold night ahead. And because of the collective power of the birds, it protects them. Look on the right, you can see a predator being chased away by the smaller birds. There's no one leader, but there is leadership. Leadership is constantly changing. It's sort of a collaborative kind of leadership that occurs. And scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. You're functioning on the basis of some principles. We do this together. We must always keep moving and don't bump into the next. And when the moment is right, this spectacular thing happens. Now, this is not some kind of collective intelligence because starlings are not intelligent as creatures and they don't have consciousness, but humans do. And it made us wonder, what would it mean for us to be able to connect ourselves and our brains to these vast networks of glass and of air? Could we go beyond just sharing information and knowledge to start to share our intellect? Maybe to create some kind of intelligence or even consciousness that transcends an individual. Well, if we could do that, maybe many of the things in the enterprise that have eluded us could be achieved. Take uh, the learning organization. You've all read about that. Well, organizations that aren't conscious can't learn. Maybe some kind of consciousness is a precondition for organizational learning. Now, I don't know if this is a fanciful analogy or if there's something there, but I look at those kids today in the streets, in, back in the streets now in Egypt, to take this to the next level and throughout the Arab Spring. And they're using the internet to build collective strength. You know, they protected themselves from murderers. In Tunisia, snipers from the old regime and in Egypt were shooting unarmed kids in the street. They geolocated the snipers and sent the photos to friendly units in the military who came in and took out the snipers. The internet can be used as a tool to collectively defend ourselves from killers. And I look at this thing and I don't know, I get, I get great hope because you know, a, a great a, a philosopher, George Santayana, said, we should welcome the future for soon it will be the past. But we should respect the past for it was once all that was humanly possible. Well, we did what was possible in the enterprise, but arguably it's now possible to go forward. And maybe if we can extend out through network intelligence, this age uh, will be one of promise fulfilled and of peril unrequited. Uh, one thing for sure is the next period for you will not be boring, so thanks very much. Thank you.